This conference will now be recorded. Hey everybody and welcome to the ANCAN High Risk Recurrent and Advanced Prostate Cancer Video Chat for Monday, February 19, 2024. I'm Len Sierra. I'll be your moderator for tonight and a little help from the other moderators and the whole group here. Uh, we want to thank and acknowledge our sponsors, as we always do, and they are Bayer, Pfizer, Myovent, Janssen, Myriad, Telix, Foundation Medicine, and that's all I have, unless you've got more, Rick. Uh, not not Pfizer. We've, we not dropped before. Pfizer a while back. We just haven't Alexa hasn't had a chance to correct the logo, but hopefully Pfizer will be back in the fold this year. All right. <clears throat> a quick right. question. Yeah, question. go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You said this is the high intermediate group? This is high risk, uh, recurrent or advanced. Okay. I, I, I thought we were doing every two weeks with the low intermediate group. I must be off yeah. every week. We yeah, are. We are. This, is not, this is not that so, group. It's it's <laughs> not John. It's not every two weeks. It's second and fourth Mondays. Got okay. it. Okay. All There's right. And guy. and the and the this group is first and third Mondays. Got it. All right. Well then, I will. Okay. But you're well. You, huh? You're welcome to hang in. Um. But if you don't want to hear welcome. what's going on here, then yeah, we. Yeah, well. Okay. All right. All right. The, oh, is that Jim I, Barnes? I will, I will... It, it is Jim Barnes. Barnes. Yay, Jim. Hi, guys. Long time no see. How you doing? Hey, yeah, Jim. it has been a long time. I'm, I'm doing well, thanks. Well, I hope you're going to give us an update. Oh, I'd be happy to or answer any questions anybody has. Well, about my yeah, why don't we start with you, Jim, since we haven't seen you in a long time. Oh, geez. <laughs> unless, you want, unless you want time to pull your story together while I go on to someone else. Uh, sure, that might, that, might, that might be best. Okay. We'll I'm, do not, that. I'm not we'll sure come... where to begin with my story, but. All right, I'll come back to you later. So let's start with Jeff Markey in that case. Hello there. I'm going to just do a quick refresh of what happened. Uh, last July, I was in the hospital for AFib for four days, and as a result, my doctor pulled me off Zytiga. I've been on Zytiga for two and a half years. I was, my PSA had bumped, gone up and down continuously, and uh, I tried dro dropping back to three pills, and my PSA immediately went up to one. Um, I, I started darolumide in August, and uh, my PSA went from down from 1 to 0 0.3, and then went to 0 0.1, and then went to 0.2. And then I had radiation on the L4 of my spine, metastasis. And uh, the next month, my PSA went, went down to 0 0.1, and for the last three months, it's been less than 0 0.1, undetectable. So darolumide seems to really do the job much better than Zytiga ever did. So I uh, just uh, a little boost for darolutamide is a very useful product. Maybe the other lutamides work as well, but darolutamide doesn't have the side effects. So that's... Uh... Well, not only that, but it's, uh, it's good to hear that even after you failed abiraterone or abiraterone failed you, that um, darolutamide was able to keep on working. Yeah, no, yeah, three that months. Doesn't happen too often. 2019 was the last time I was undetectable for three months, and uh, so it's been five years since been the same condition. So they just uh, radiated that one uh, spinal vertebrae, right? Yeah, L4. Had four sessions. Four sessions. How many grays? Yeah. Do you know? I don't know what that means. How many uh, what? Oh, grays. Grays. The radiation dose. No, I'm not sure. I I really do not know the answer to that. Okay. They did have a reduced 
amount of radiation each time rather than do it with less fewer sessions because the uh, the L4 was already damaged and uh, the canal compressed so they uh, wanted to take it easy on it and I guess between the that was the only metastasis I had and between removing that and uh, I mean normally they say uh, if you have it out it's not gonna your PSA may not go down but mine definitely did for one reason or another. And Jeff, had you had any prior radiation? Well, back in, uh, I think it was 2014, I had you know, like 35 okay. sessions. All but right. that was the prostate bed. Just the prostate bed? Yeah. Okay. So That's no side thing. effects from the L4? No, no, none at all. I've been just fine since having that done. It's uh, that's why they well they did it in four sessions because they wanted to do less damage if they could. And uh, I mean, they, they tell you that your PSA may not go down, but boy, <laughs> mine sure did. Yeah, but may, I think darolutamide is a, a, a factor as well. Yep. Okay, guys, any questions for Jeff? It's John. I was just thinking it must have been a real kick to see a non-detectable number after all this time. Yeah, especially the third month. I was surprised that because Zytiga never gave me a break. I mean, my BSA jumped up and down every month. And yeah. It was, it was really nice to see it. Yeah, I got to say, um, first six years of my uh, prostate cancer, I never became undetectable until I went on uh, darolutamide. And wow. then I became undetectable <laughs> for the first time in wow. that period, in six years. That seems to be so, a pattern. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Rick, you're not raising your hand, are you? All right, let's go to uh, Jerry Pelfrey. Well, this is sort of uh, uh, coincidental. Uh, I, uh, a year in 22, in uh, August of 22, I had a spot on L4. And I did SBRT. It was no, I didn't do SBRT. They did a uh, therapy on me on L4. Now, uh, at this time, it showed up again on L4, and it's seven millimeters. Uh, so it's not huge. Uh, but it's on L4, and it's the only metastasis I have. Now, uh, I stopped Zytiga the uh, last week of December, and I started darolutamide the uh, six weeks ago. So I'm off Zytiga, off prednisone now. I titrated off. Uh, before I stopped Zytiga, the end of December, my PSA had gone up to 0 0.91. When I went and visited Dr. E, it dropped to 0 0.55. And then just recently, two weeks ago, it is now 0 0.55. To six. So I'm having the same reaction with darolutamide uh, that was just commented on. But here's my dilemma. Before we did my last PSA, I was at Mayo Radiation Oncology talking about getting L4 uh, and having an SBRT done on it. And um, just last week, I was in doing the assimilation and the MRI. But just today, I had an appointment with my local medonc, and he 
threw out something I hadn't thought of before. And he said, why in the world are you going to do radiation again on L4 when it's that small and the potential uh, for radiation again on L4 can, you know, you, you can weaken it, obviously, and you can even uh, possibly get a, uh, a fracture in it. So now my dilemma is, do I stop the SBRT and wait, like he suggested, I'm doing another PSMA scan with Dr. E uh, at the end of April, and he wants me to wait until the end of April and see what that PSMA shows before I go and do the SBRT on it. That's my dilemma. I mean, I'm leaning toward just calling Mayo and telling him to stop. I'm not doing it right now. Um, my medoc here has used darolutamide for quite a while, and uh, he's of the opinion that darolutamide uh, could very well get rid of that seven millimeter lesion on L4. I'll take any, you know, any suggestions or ideas or what you would think you would do. Not hearing any sound yet. From any of you. Uh, Peter Kafka, go ahead. You're can muted, I, Peter. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah. I guess this is Jerry for Jerry and Jeff. Are you both on monotherapy darolutamide or are you taking an LHRH drug like Lupron as well? Oh, I'm taking Orgavex. Lupron. Okay, so you're not monotherapy. Interesting. Okay, thanks. Hand me my Orgavex. So can I ask you a question? Go ahead, Jack. You, you, you In said, the middle. Uh, yeah, I'll take that too. Your medical oncologist In the middle. told you. Well, hold on. Is somebody talking? Could you please mute? You said your medical oncologist told you that he can disappear it with darolutamide. He said disappear. Is he saying he can just make it non-visible to um, to the PSMA uh, um, a scan or, or 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 extinguish it as if you had radiation, which 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 radi radiation has the potential to uh, to do, assuming it doesn't damage the. Um, uh, the vertebrae and the nerves surrounding it that you're afraid of. I'm not sure I understand what he said. He can disappear it, make it go away in lieu of radiation as if he's that's... no, he didn't say that. What he said was I've only been on darolutamide for six weeks. And he thinks that, uh, you know, another month or two on darolutamide to see if darolutamide would take care of it. Take care of. What does that mean? Well, get rid of the cancer on L4. I, I, educate me, guys. Is that a, is that reality? Is that that a Lutamite can do that? I don't know. Well, that's... It did it yeah, for me. Jack. Sure, sure it can. I mean, that that's why we take antiandrogens, Jack. I mean, we take and just... we take anti antiandrogens to prevent the testosterone getting getting to the tumor. And so you're starving the tumor of, a, of, of, of a testosterone and, and it can diminish. Yeah, it can happen. I, it's, I, it's agree. Very I, agree. I agree, diminish, you know, put it to sleep, you know, put it out of... Uh, well, I, I mean, well, well, I don't know if it'll go, but we won't see it. Okay. I don't, uh, let's, not get in, let's not get into the discussion as to whether uh you you remove tumors altogether or whether they just go to sleep and we don't see them because we'll be here all night on that one right, but well, i think I the answer is it can i have a different issue for, for for jerry which is you've got three docs involved here you've got a local doc you've got a mayo doc and you've got dr e now i um i know that peter doesn't have an issue um, running his treatment by consensus. I personally don't think it's a good idea. I think that you've got to choose who you want to follow and go with that doc. And I think that um, 
you know, last time when we spoke about this, we had this discussion, I think a week or two weeks ago about what to do with mail. You were going to ask Dr. F. Stathew what she suggested. Have you done that? Uh, yes, but... Uh, and what did she suggest? Did she, she say did go it. ahead and radiate or did she, she say not radiate? All right. What she said on my first visit with her, I've had a video conference with her since then. Right. But on the first visit, she said... I okay, but do the, the last visit. What did she say on the last visit, mm -hmm. Jerry? What she did she say? What? We, I didn't ask her. She only had 10 minutes. It was a real quick update. Okay, uh, well, I, I so think you've got to ask her. That's what we said. You know, we, we talk about this. We don't want to recap what we've said before. We had this discussion last time because I remember saying to you, what, what did Dr. E say? And you said, well, I'm talking to her next week. So no, let's not... Let's not take up the group's time and recover what we've already done. If it were you me, asked a, you asked if it were me, I would ask Dr. E, what should I do? Because the problem is that if you, if you, if you go to a doctor and, and you're looking to them and then you go somewhere else and then you go somewhere else, you're going to lose the confidence of the doctor. I've seen it before. So the answer you're, you're, is if you like Dr. E as a as a quarterback, I would ask Dr. Free. Subject. You asked me a question and you didn't let me answer it. Yeah, because you're repeating what you told us before, Jerry. That we've she heard said it. She could do lutetium, lutetium, but she didn't want to. She'd rather have me do the x ray. Now, that's what she said then. All right. Period. End. That was two now. months ago. What is she saying now? I haven't I mean, talked we, to her yet. I just found out about this today. You just exactly. found out about what? You just found out you had the seven millimeter lesion. You didn't know that? I knew that, Rick. I didn't know that darolutamide could very well clear it up without radiation. We don't know that. That's total speculation. We know that it can control it. It's total speculation. We've got to come back to the, we've got to come back to the to, to what we know, which is Land. I've got a seven I've got a seven millimeter lesion, and should I radiate it or not mm -hmm. in the context of the, my treatment and in the context of my quarterback? That's what we've got to come back to. Fine. And you haven't asked her. So to come in and, and go through what we went through two weeks ago or three I'm weeks ago, should I have the radiation or should I not? I don't see the point of, Rick, of bringing, it back to the, bringing it back to the forum. I'm not bringing it back. I'm bringing something new, which I didn't What are know. you bringing new? That darolutamide could do it. Darolutamide could always not, do like it. I not have the radiation if... If I can wait three months to prove it, why should I radiate and, and have the chances of having uh, something happen due to the radiation? Look, and I believe Jerry, Glenn said it happened to him. Jerry, just use what's between your ears a little bit, man. We, the reason you're on therapy, whatever it is, single line or double line therapy, is to control the cancer. And we know that sometimes people, people, we don't see lesions when they're on the therapy. The lesions go away. You've been in this group long enough, you know it. So to say, well, this is new information for me, I don't think so. And it's certainly not new that. information. It's certainly not new information for Dr. Evstathio. My send her an email. Write an email, to... say, Dr. F. Stathia, should I have this radiation or not? That's what we are. We suggested you do. But when people don't do what we suggest, and then they come back and ask us the same thing based on, oh, well, I'm taking darolutamide, I don't get it, personally. So we that, can, we can, right. we can move on should or I someone the, else can go. I ask the rest of the group what they think? Sure. Right. Hey, Jerry. Uh, Jeff Markey, you've had your hand up. 
Jerry, you said you had a procedure, not radiation the first time. What do you mean by procedure? Oh, it was there. It was a therapy. It wasn't. What does that mean? That means that they, it was. Radiation? It, it was radiation to L3, L4, and L5. But not SBRT. Not SBRT. Did you have multiple it, radiation of C procedures? One procedure. One. Okay, but it wasn't SBRT. No. Len, did I hear you say it happened to you? Yes, I had bone mets detected. I went on darolutamide, and after a while, uh, my PSA was undetectable. And the next scan that I got a few years later showed that those old lesions had disappeared. Will they okay. come back? Thank you. Are they in a dormant state? I don't know. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I'm off. Uh, Tom Jacobson, go ahead. Here we go. Uh, yeah, Len. Quick question. You just said you got you got a scan. What kind of scan did you get? PSMA PET. What's your your PSA had already dropped to undetectable? Well, that was, uh, it had dropped to undetectable. Then I went on a 21 month drug holiday and it started rising. And when it hit 0 0.17, I had another PSMA PET scan. Okay, so you feel that 0 0.17. So you feel like that was probably reasonably accurate? I get confused I guess, yeah. on these PSMA scans where we're talking about such low PSA values that they don't seem to always be that accurate. So that's my that was my question. Yeah, but I, I think we've come to the conclusion now that that um, you can run them at less than 0.2, Tom. And there are doctors like D'Amico at Dana-Farber who recommends you do. So, I, um, you know, Fair whereas enough. I think a year ago or two years ago, we would have said that. I think we've probably changed our opinion. Some of that has to do with a better ability to read the scans. I think people can read them better now than they could a year or two years ago. But if you haven't seen that um, D'Amico piece, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the uh, chat window for you. I'll put the link in the chat window for you, and I I do recommend that you 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 read it. We've 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 we, it was in the reminder one time, sure. and we refer reference it fairly frequently. Very good, thank I'd you. I'd like to make uh, to Tom's point that that there are a couple of different kinds of accuracy. One kind is called sensitivity. And sensitivity is the kind of accuracy that if a lesion is there, then the test will pick it up. So PSMA scans are, are quite sensitive. And as Tom, as you pointed out, you get down to the, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.1 ranges. It's more and more difficult to pick up a cancer, but if there's another kind of accuracy called specificity, specificity is when the when the test shows something that the something is a cancer. So, you know, let's say your PSMA scan shows a shadow on a bone somewhere, but it's really due to something else. It's not cancer at all. That's where specificity fails. So there's two kinds of two kinds of accuracy, sensitivity and specificity. Now, like like Rick says, it's turning out that the sensitivity of P PSMA scan is not zero, below 0 0.6, like we used to think it is. It still has sensitivity. It's still able to pick up cancers. It's always been uh, had specif the specificity doesn't change. That's, that is to say, if it says cancer, is it really cancer? 
a different kind of accuracy. So more and more people are doing scans at very low PSA levels. My uh, doc says that when my PSA hits 0.2, for example, he's going to send me for a PSMA scan, something that we would have thought was a waste of time only a couple of years ago. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Um, yeah, that, that just that clears it up a little bit. I guess I feel like since mine is undetectable, I understand people, and including Len, have gone on holidays to get their uh, PSAs up, so maybe the PSMA is more accurate. But I guess in my gut, I feel like I'm playing with fire if I do that. So uh, it's a, uh, I don't know, I don't know how to deal with that. So I, playing I with fire that. in the sense that it might pick up something. You mean uh, playing with fire in the sense that yeah, that that I may be encouraging spread instead of just a better analysis encouraging spread by letting my PSA go up. Yes. Oh, oh, yes, yes. I see what you mean. And I think yeah. he, he means he doesn't want to go on a drug holiday. Is that right, Tom? Uh, yeah, I'm a little paranoid about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. I was I, too. It's not, well, it's not fine paranoid. because I don't, when people ask me, and I don't want to take up more time, but when people ask me, has it spread or where, 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 what is your status right now? I honestly don't know because all I've had are full bone scans and CT scans. Um, so so I, don't, I don't think you're taking up time at all, Tom. This is a very valid dilemma that a lot of guys face and it's worth unpacking it, especially on a day like today where we don't have a lot of new people. Um, I don't think Len goes on a holiday to let his PSA rise so he can see where his cancer is. I think Len goes on a holiday for quality of life reasons because he wants to yeah. feel better. And I think that's why most men probably would go. Now, the question is, when do you come off the holiday? And some guys may let it run longer than others, A, because they're enjoying their quality of life, or B, because they want to be more certain they're going to get a result from their PSMA scan for the next step. But that having said that, um, you know, it's like, it's like our early low-risk low guys on active surveillance who have tremendous anxiety because they're on active surveillance. Once you go on a holiday, you're also on active surveillance, but you're on advanced treatment active surveillance and active surveillance, what comes with active surveillance, whether it's early or whether it's late, is a degree of anxiety. Some people hang, handle anxiety better than others. Len ha happens to handle it well. That, that's his mentality. But if, you, um, if you're a nervous Nelly type, then it is going to be hard for you. I mean, I, I'd like to hear from our um, psychiatrists on... on on what they have to say about the anxiety and the and, and, and active surveillance. Well, if I, end up in that, if I end up in that situation, Rick, I don't know if it's that stay, whether it's a year or two from now, hopefully taking a vacation. Uh, personally, I'm not sure if I'll be as much a nervous Nelly as I would have been in the past. I think it's a function of how you start looking at, you know, um, the end of life and how you've evolved to accept it or not, and, uh, and, uh, and how willing you are to risk putting yourself in a situation where you could you know, be uh, uh, risking a reoccurrence if you let the quality of life uh, supersede uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the prophylaxis of the medication. So uh, I, I think that I can generalize uh, from anybody uh, to my own personal self is it really depends on, like you said, how you can handle the reality of the possibility of a reoccurrence and metastasis that could be um, detrimental to your longevity. Um, I don't know how I will be, but I don't think I'll be as much a nervous Nelly when I'm 86 as I am where it was when I was 80. 
you know, for whatever reason. I, th I think something happens as you get older that allows you to come to terms with the fact that you've had a fairly decent life and therefore you don't have to be as, uh, as spastic about the whole thing. I, well, I agree with you, Jack. If I turn and out to be a nervous Nelly, please slap me. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not feeling like a nervous Nelly. I'm really just talking about the potential for spread, not for not the psychological aspects of oh, it. That's that's, that's what Rick was addressing, though. Yeah. Okay. John, you want to add anything? When, uh, when there's a clear, when there's a clear choice of what to do from the literature, then that's what we should do, whether we're nervous or not. When there's not a clear choice, then the patient's own preference uh, gets added into the decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, is the person a risk taker? Or do they want to play it really safe? You know, uh, styling the according to the patient's own preference, uh, you know, makes makes sense. But uh, but when we have a clear, uh, uh, you know, when the guidelines say do this, and the literature backs it backs it up, then we shouldn't let our anxiety or lack of anxiety influence our decisions. All right, we've got three guys with their hands raised. Uh, Dennis, Korea, go ahead. Yeah, relative to when to get the PSMA based uh, test based on your PS current PSA level, uh, I think there's a couple of other factors. Whether you've had a prostatectomy or not uh, would make a difference. If you had, a, if, I, I would think that if you've had a prostatectomy. And you'd be looking at those levels down at point one, point two. We maybe want to get some attention. Uh, if you've not had a prostatectomy, and uh, I think you could go with a higher PSMA, a PSA t uh, level before you get the PSMA pad. And the other factor is how fast it's moving or doubling your PSA. Is it going up really quick? Then. I, even if I heard that a lower level, I think I'd want to get get the PSMA pet. Does that make any sense? All right. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Jim, Marshall? Uh, yes, yeah, same way. I was under treatment for five years, and I was a bit uh, skeptical, but I happened to jump in, and now it's been 21 months undetectable, and I feel good. And I'm probably going to go on till it uh, starts to rise to about a 0.6 and get a PET scan, okay, a PSMA, just to find out where, and then I will start up again under treatment. All right, but I wouldn't necessarily uh, cut that in stone, uh, Jim, that you wanted to go to 0 0.6. Like Dennis just said, it depends. If you have a uh, PSA doubling time that's, let's say, less oh, than nine yeah. months, you might want to get it done sooner. Oh, yeah. I mean, that is that is yeah. just in general, you know, yeah. to shoot for, but it will depend how fast it uh, starts to climb. Okay. Uh, Peter, go ahead. Kafka. Yeah, I'm going to go out on a limb here, but this, I'm just talking from my experience. I can't, I'm not telling anybody what to do. Uh, I've had four PSMA scans over the last 10 years or less. Um, and some of them have led to treatments. Some of them have uh, not. Uh, most of them have led to treatment. All of them have been done with my PSA at about 0.8 to 2. And I've managed to keep my PSA pretty low, um, you know, in the one to two range or 0.5 to two range over these past years. Um, and I don't know, my philosophy and my philosophy can change. It might change next week. I don't know. 
Well, my philosophy is that for many of us, even with advanced disease, prostate cancer can still be a slow growing disease. It doesn't necessarily need to mean it's a runaway freight train. I've known guys where it was a runaway freight train where their PSA one month was a thousand, next month it was 2000, next month 3000, et cetera. I mean, I mean, and where we're, all kinds of treatments just failed and, and we knew the end of the road was coming. Um, mine hasn't reacted that way. It's still been low. It's never, it's not been undetectable. And I've known for a long time that the cat's going to keep coming back. It's on the doorstep the very next day. And, um, and I might have to do something, but I'm, I'm okay about it. And even if, if it doubles, like it did, uh, a month or so ago, it's still at a low level from one to two. And, um, and I can live with that. And, uh, and oddly enough, even when it doubled, my scan showed that my metastasis had gone down since uh, two years ago. So uh, I'm giving it the benefit of the doubt. That's, that's where I am with this stuff. stuff. And uh, that's where my philosophy is today. As I said, it might change next week, but uh, that's how I'm treating it. Okay, thanks, Peter. And uh, Jim Barnes, so you you feel prepared now, or would you like me to come back later? No, I'm good. Okay, so please fill us in on what's happened. We last we heard you went to Germany, I believe, for Plavicto. Close. Oh, no, Austria. Austria was it Actinium? Or it was, uh, Vienna, 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 Austria, and right. uh, go ahead. So yes, for for the first the for for a couple treatments. So it took multiple trips and multiple treatments over there to um, you know administer the treatments that the doctors had agreed on. And uh, you know, so I had you know back back in December I went and it was I had a, a, a treatment of uh, actinium. Um, and it was, it, 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 was no big deal. And keep in mind, I've been, I've been through every standard of care treatment, including six rounds of, uh, Plavicto in the U S. So I went over there. So I'm, you know, I'm very familiar with Plavicto and the side effects and what have you. And the actinium was a little, just a little heavier side effects slightly in terms of dry mouth. That's, that's the big side effect that everybody's concerned about. And and it's there and it it it's it, it's uh it's real, and it, it does happen. So I mean, in the middle of the night, you wake up in your mouth and your windpipes are just totally dry, um you know. So you know, there's there's lozenges they can give you and the biotines and all, all those all those sort of things really really help. And uh, just drink just drinking lots of water and uh, you know that that sort of thing. But it does it does uh, it does also affect uh, eating and swallowing food a little bit. Um, you know, because you don't have that saliva. So even, even I was eating broccoli salad today and I found myself having to wash it down quite a bit with water. So there's really, that, that was really the only side effects I had. I had some aches and pains after I had the actinium in what I, you know, I assume was the, my, 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 um, metastases, um, reacting to the actinium. But with regard to the actinium, that was, that was really it. And then I went back for two more treatments because the doctor wanted to give me uh, combined actinium with lutetium. And even though I ha already had six rounds in the United States, by the way, what prompted what, what prompted me and what got me off my butt to go over there was back in November, my, my PSA had shot up to like 40 and uh, they did, we did a, a PSMA scan and there was significant disease progression very very avid psma um so i have i have like i have i have like 100 100 lesions or 100 metastases in my body and many many are many are my very very small micro um type of metastases uh but uh you know that's that's why that's why i got off my butt and just said hey i'm gonna i'm gonna run over there i heard, heard good things about these people over there and they were that they were successful so then I went back in January and February. Um, the uh, um, 
and when I went back, when I went back in January, we also did an FD, FDG scan, and the FDG scan showed minimal uptake from the original FDG scan. So they were conf we're confident. The doctors are confident they're 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 dealing with adenocarcinoma, and they're just it's just a stubborn stubborn case of it or an aggressive case of it. And so that's um, you know uh, went over there for the for the for the three three treatments. It is not budget sensitive, I will tell you that. Um, so, um, you know, I'd be happy to happy, happy to answer answer any questions. So, oh, and here's one other thing: they they actually at the end at, at the end of my last uh, lutetium treatment, they um, put me on a PARP inhibitor. So for the last couple of days, I've been on a PARP inhibitor because I, I just had the treatment last Tuesday. I was just in Vienna last Tuesday. And I was in Miami on Saturday, David. I almost called you. I was, I was checking out the boat show. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's interesting. The lutetium over there is not the lutetium that they use over here. Over here, they use pl Plavicto from Novartis. It is not, you can, you can get Plavicto over there at a much more significant cost. It is a, it is a brand of lutetium called I. And they, I mean, it's three letters, I, ampersand, T, and the, and the it, acronym. It's really not, is. Jim, it's not the lutetium that's different. It's, it's the ligand. It's what connects the lutetium to the cancer. And there are a number of different types. Um, I think INT is the J591, is the same as J591, um, which is what, they've been using a while Cornell and it's an antibody. And I've actually, as recently as today, was watching a, 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 a video on that from Australia. Um, I want to let you finish and then I'll talk a little bit about, about that. But it, it, I just want to point out to everybody, the lutetium's the same lutetium, but how the lutetium gets into the cancer that that there are several different ways that can happen with small molecules with large molecules antibodies um, forget the different terminologies but len will help me or ben's not on but john will help me some one of the, one of the brains trust will help me but... so thanks for telling that where where's your has your psa gone down so here, here's what's here's what's crazy, you know. So my PSA, my PSA in February, I had, I, you know, when I had, uh, I had my PSA normally checked, and it, and it was still at 40 after, um, after after uh, the uh, actinium actinium treatment, and then and then the next then the next time I had it tested, it was 18. Um, it went down to 18. That was so that was good. But the very next week, when I had the FDG scan, I also got a, a blood test, uh, coincidentally. And my within one week, my PSA went from 18 to back to 40. That's kind of crazy. So that's why when I had this last lutetium treatment over there, that they put me on uh, Leprenza, the PARP inhibitor, to uh, block the PARP proteins from... Linpaza. Lynn Parza. but but do you have any do you have any mutations that indicate no no, no. no. I mean the, there is I, I mean I think we can pretty categorically state after this last GU ASCO that we do not see any benefit from a PARP inhibitor unless you carry certain mutations so Maybe they're doing it for another reason, but there's just absolutely no evidence anywhere um, that a PARP inhibitor has an impact. There were posters on that. There were discussions on that. I'm sure if you come next week and join us an hour early when we're going to go through um, what we consider to be the better presentations and the better posters, um, we can actually point you so you can read for yourself, um, our big concern, you've just started, so I just want to give give this a, a shout out. Our big concern is that the PARP inhibitors are really toxic. 
And so the longer you're Did you say on, toxic? yes. Did you say toxic? And we, yes. Yes. I have, and we've seen... I have blood work scheduled this week. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd be doing my blood work every week if I was on a PARP inhibitor right now. From what we've seen in this group and from what we've read and seen in the trials, um, you know, we're, we're, we're all... And thrombosis and all that stuff, yeah, for sure. Well, I, I think it's more more the, 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 the blood counts, the myelo the myelofibrosis rather than thrombosis. And I don't know, I, I'll defer to Len and to, to Dr. John to comment on, on the toxicity of the PARP inhibitors. But I mean, I, I just know that it is, it, it's significant. It, it's definitely a factor. It shows up in all the trials. And I to do to it at the that. same time as the lutetium or, uh, sorry, or the actinium um, is a concern. Yeah, so the biggest, uh, the most common side effects from the PARP inhibitors are anemia and bone marrow suppression. So your white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, they all tend to go down. And they may, they may have already taken a hit from the actinium and the lutetium. Uh, do you know what your blood values are right now, Jim? Uh, I do. I do not. I do not know right now. I'm, I'm having a blood test this week. But my blood work, is all, but my blood work has always come back very strong, and that's what they, uh, you know, based uh, some of these treatments, my ability to handle the treatments. Um, you know, my hematic crit and the uh, red and white blood cells all look all all look good. Good. Uh, and how are and you I'm feeling? Still, yeah. You know the the PARP inhibitor is a you know it, it's a little it's a little draining, but I, I got I got seven thousand steps in today, um, so just making sure I'm keeping active and moving. Um, so I mean right now I mean I feel good, um, you know m most of the time. Sometimes just just hits me and I'll get a hot flash and I have to take my jacket off and things like that. But generally generally I feel good after after all this. Okay. Yep. Good. But now my, P, now my PSA is up to 54, by the way. So it's, it's still rising. That's, that's why. That's why. Uh, Tom Jacobson, could you mute? I just that's muted him. After, after, that's, why, that's why he put me on a PARP inhibitor, because he saw that he needed, to, he, he felt the combination would be effective or could be effective. I'd be real interested to see what he's basing that on. Um, if there is any research about combining, I, I think there was one thing, but I'm not sure, sort of sticks in my mind, maybe Len, Len's better at this than I am, but um, I think the concern in, with the PARP inhibitor and the, um, and the radionuclide ligand all at the same time was, um, was side effects but we'd have to go in and look but i'd i would like to ask the doc in austria what where he's coming up with this um the the reason oh, well, I, why you know, we he, he, he referred to a study and i will uh i will i will i will uh, that'd be great ask him about that again. yeah um i mean the reason we're coming we, we, you know we we hammer on it is because we've seen we've seen the use of PARP inhibitors for a long time now in this group, in this group. And we've seen that they can be pretty toxic, certainly after a little bit of time. And we feel strongly that they shouldn't be used unless there's a chance that there could be some success. And certainly outside of the radio um, nuclide uh, therapy context we're almost certain that there's no success unless you're carrying BRCA1 BRCA2 maybe ATM and even a bigger maybe of PAOB those are the only places it seems to work 
and so it shouldn't be given out like candy because of the toxicity now again um I, I, there is a I, I, if your doc says there's a study and i've got it in the back of my mind there's a study i'm pretty sure there is a study somewhere but i can't i just can't recall it and i can't i can't recall what what, what it came up with I will try to uh, get that. I think Go it's on. kind of fascinating that the, the, this, this idea of following um, actinium up with a couple of hits of lutetium, you know? Yeah. Top, it's like topping yeah. off a high energy, short pathway radiation with a little bit of low energy, long pathway radiation. I, I don't, uh, I don't know the rationale, but it's, it seems like a fascinating uh, idea. I wonder if they do it frequently. And I would, I, I would also point out that the, um, uh, the interval between lutetium treatments is short, which is shorter. It's only four weeks as opposed to when I had it here, it was six weeks when I had the Flavicto here. Mm -hmm. So I'll take this opportunity just to talk a little bit about this new TLX591 trial that was launched late last year and is coming to this country. Um, and I heard a little bit about it um, when I was at GUASCO in an, advise, an, an advisory board to TLX. But what it, it uses... Um, it uses the um, antibody, um, the molecular antibody 591, uh, which is a large molecule and has a lot of benefits and links it with actinium. And the actinium seems to be in many ways a much better treatment than the lutetium. Um, the J5, the, the actinium is an alpha rather than a, a, a beta form of radiation. So it's a lot more intense and it's a lot more focused. Um, and this, this, um, this antibody, uh, this molecular antibody, um, stays in the system a lot longer. So versus 617 where it'll move through the system in a matter of hours these um the j591 circulates for about two weeks so it's continuing to do its work and what they see is that um you can deliver less radiation because it stays around a lot longer and the half-life is much longer and so the scans that they do on men over the period, you can see it working over a two week period. And the, um, the protocol for this 591 is just two, is just two treatments. Um, so it's pretty exciting. It's going to be available here very soon. Telix has asked us if we'll do a presentation, which I think we will on, on the trial, um, probably in the second quarter when they get rolling in, in, in the United States. They've asked us, um, well, I've asked them to elaborate on the difference between the alpha and the beta, um, which is pretty remarkable when you see the alpha molecule, the alpha radiation and the beta radiation side by side and the difference in the, of the impact. And I've also asked them to talk a little bit about this large um, molecular antibody um, treatment versus the the 617 type molecule. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot going on in this space and hopefully we'll, we'll be bringing it to you. Um, the guy uh, that they work with closely, Telix works with closely is Nat Lenzo and he's actually treated some of our guy he, he's in australia um 
and I met him. He was here, good guy. Um, so he'll probably do the presentation. Um, so yeah, there's a there's there's a lot of good things, and I can see I can see why the actinium had an effect. I I'm not so sure what the benefit is of combining it. Um, I don't think that Scott Tagawa found a huge amount of benefit from from combining it. Um, so I'm not really sure about that. Um, but you know, it's it's all new stuff. I don't know, Len or, or John or anybody else. Do you want to add anything on the on this on the alpha or on the large molecule um, delivery? I could just say that uh, if any of this radiation stuff is confusing anybody, I uh, uh, refer to my little primer on radiation I wrote a couple of months ago for this group. John, can can we, uh, John, can we take that? If, could you put that primer into a form where we can make a blog post of it? Because it, it's easier to find as a blog post than it is to go back through the reminders. Okay. If you just send it to me or to Alexa, we'll, we'll turn it into a blog post, and then we'll be able to pull it up real easy. Okay. Yeah, an so, interesting, interesting analogy that I heard uh, regarding the alpha versus the beta is the beta is like shooting something with a BB gun. The alpha is like shooting something with a shotgun. Yeah, did I, did exactly. I hear that from, did I hear that from Len? Maybe. I'm not I'm sure. I'm not sure it was me, but, but I, uh, remembering the talk that uh, Dr. Um, Sarter gave where he, he talked about um, – Actinium probably being the better agent if uh, for targeting micrometastases, which you said you had a lot of, Jim. Yes. The reason being that it only requires one hit from a alpha particle because of its high right. energy to to take right. out a cancer cell, whereas the beta emitter uh, at much lower energy requires multiple hits. Uh, so if you only have a very small, um, you know, micrometastatic lesion, you're probably not going to get enough uh, of the beta delivered to that area. Whereas the, the alpha emitter, like actinium, uh, it's sufficient to, to kill uh, the micrometastases. Yeah. Because I think that... Like Crossfire. I think, what? Len, it was, it's 7,000. This is why when you put the two together, it's just so remarkable. Yeah. One hit of actinium is equivalent to 7,000 hits of lutetium. Yeah. With 617, with 617. Uh, Gary, go ahead. Gary Peters. Uh, Jim, what... Um, uh, why did you have to go to Vienna um, to get treated? Were were you not offered any of this treatment here? Um, it was a different treatment approach over there, and plus uh, they had the availability of uh, actinium. Um, I could not find uh, actinium here in the uh, U.S. And I, was, I wanted I wanted to try something different, some something that allegedly they were having more success with, uh, and that was I thought that was overseas, uh, based so, on based based on my research. So so to answer your question, Gary, actinium, there has been no FDA approval of actinium in this country, so the only way it's available is through a trial, and the trials are somewhat limited. And it, Tagawa was working with the actinium on I, I and T. I think I and T is actually um, licensed to Wild Cornell over here. And I, I, I'm pretty sure it's the same antibody. This J591 is, is, is the I and T. Um, I want to address Peter's question um, because, Peter, that's exactly why we had that webinar a couple of weeks, three weeks ago. Um, if you haven't seen it, um, 
I, I recommend you watch it because we try to bring out this whole dilemma between a G, the GU medonx and the radiation on and the um, radionuclide dots. So there is a real problem. Most of the centers of excellence now do have radionuclide docks. Um, there are a few GU medical oncologists who happen to be experts in radionuclide medicine, and one of them is Oliver Sartor, but most of them are not that familiar with it. So they know how to do it, but they don't, that they, they, but they don't really understand the physics. On the other hand, you've got the radionuclide docs who understand the physics, but they don't have the expertise in clinical treatment. And these were some of the questions that Dr. John posed to Dr. Kuo and Dr. Sartor, and that's why we had that webinar. I don't, I'm not sure we brought it out as much as we hoped. We had a couple of logistical problems. Dr. Sartor was very late arriving, and then it wasn't clear that he was in the room, and we were going to spend more time on developing that conversation. But there's a lot of good information to answer the question you're asking. Did you did you watch the webinar, Peter? I haven't had a chance yet. I will. Okay. Well, that's that's what the webinar is about. That's what. Okay. That's exact. Your question is the the reason we had that webinar. Okay. Any, anybody okay. else want to comment? Maybe you saw the webinar or um, on this, I would this just, issue. I would just I would just comment that the way the I, I am it was explained to me that the way the lutetium and the actinium work is that they they damage the chromosomes in the cancer cells. They don't necessarily necessarily kill it immediately. And when that cancer cell goes to replicate, that's when it dies because it's it's you know the actinium or the lutetium treatment is has messed up the software inside the cancer cell. I think sure. if it were me getting this treatment, I wouldn't necessarily want to rely on either the GU Medonc or the nuclear medicine doc alone. I'd want them working together unless it was somebody like, unless it was someone like, like, uh, like Dr. Sato who's been working with nuclear um, radio nu nuclear medicine since 2005 or six. I mean, he actually got a shout out in the plenary at GU ASCO from Eric Small because he's a GU medical oncologist who's been working with radionuclide medicine for a long, 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 long time. But most of the docs that they don't have the GU medics that, you know, that, that they're not as familiar with it. So it's sure. good to try and bring them both together. Oh, absolutely. They are working together. They actually knew each other before I went over there, which was because my, my uh, uh, GU Medonc had a uh, familiarity with them and some relationship with them and other common patients that that's, um, you know, I felt much more confident in that. So they're both acting as part of my medical team. You know, you, you deal with so many doctors with this disease, you know, you're dealing with the radi the radiation doc, the nuclear med doc, your GU medonc, and, uh, you know, your um, uh, palliative care doc and what have you, you know, it's a, you need a, a lot of different yeah. docs for, to treat this. But, you know, the, this is why we, it takes a team and we encourage you to do that. Nat Lenzo, by the way, is another guy who's been around it a long time, who's one of the very few GU medonks who's also very well qualified to deal with radionuclide. Um, so he's he's another good example. I'm trying to think who else in this country. Um, there's maybe a couple of others, but not many. Sartor's probably the 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 the, the best example. And, and I've, I've hung on every word of his and every presentation I've seen. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. amazing. You know, uh, Rick and Jim, <clears throat> I was covering the posters for the GU um, 2024 ASCO conference. And I believe there was a, a poster about there being cross resistance 
with radionuclides and PARP inhibitors. Now, I think they only talked about uh, the fact that if you had a PARP inhibitor first and then radionuclide treatment, uh, the radionuclide treatment didn't work as well. I don't know if the reverse of that is true, but maybe something to talk to your, your doctor about, you know, that cross resistance. Kind of, kind, kind of makes sense. I mean, the, the PARP inhibitor is inhibiting PARP protein cells that are racing to heal the cancer cells, right? So the idea is you, you inhibit those, you prevent those from helping, helping to see, uh, the cancer cells to heal. And then, you know, eventually, you know, when you go to replicate, they die. And then in, in, in a several months, the idea is we're supposed to see the PSA drop, the, the disease uh, retract. Jim, are these, are there, is this considered standard of care in Europe, in these European countries? Or do they have something akin to the FDA? Or, or are these all on trial there? How, how, does, that, you know, how does that work? There, What's the there's, control? There's, there's a layer of social medicine out there, and then there's the, the private lane you know, where you see a private doctor and, you know, it's, you know, none of it's covered by our insurances here, you know, so, um, and I don't know if there is any standard of care that's similar to the standard of care that we have from the FDA. Interesting. But. Yeah, there, there is a European equivalent of the FDA, Peter. I think it's called EMA, European Medicines Agency, something like that. They're the ones that approve drugs for Europe, for the European Union. But well, it sounds Jim, like a lot of these things are trials. What was that? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Sounds like a lot of these things are trials uh, that are going on, but I don't, what do I know? Well, they're not. They're, they're trials, and they're not trials. They, 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 they are trials in the sense that it hasn't been proven, but there may not be trials sponsored by uh, approved trials sponsored by um, agencies or approved by clinicaltrials.gov or the FDA or whoever it is that that that, that does it here. It doesn't stop them offering it because in certain countries the regulations are, are, are looser but I, I i don't think is 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 what um you're doing with the guy in austria an official trial i know you're paying for it but is it still a trial jim um I would my 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 knee jerk reaction is to answer that that question no uh, but yeah. you know I you know I don't I don't know for sure yeah you, you see it's it, it's very difficult to run a trial when it's self pay because it's self selecting so you know to, to if you, if you're running a trial where you got to pay a lot of money to get into the trial then it distorts the the people that you're dealing with at the same time. They might report out the results, but it probably wouldn't be valid in getting the treatment approved in this country. But there are a lot of trials. I mean, if you look on, on clinicaltrials.gov, for example, there's this TLX 591 that they that they just launched, which is a global trial. It's already launched in Australia. It's launching here, and it's I think it's in 18 centers around the world, including Europe. That will be a trial with actinium and with this large molecule antibody. It has a trial number already. I, I, I have it somewhere, but, but it does have a trial number already. Oh, Len's posted. What did you post, Len? Tell us. Oh. No, no, it's just uh, what I said before. The European equivalent of the FDA is called the European Medicines Agency. Just a little more information there. Not just an FYI, not particularly important. 
Jim, thank you for coming back. Good to see you. We hope you'll continue coming back. And uh, oh my God, that that trip to that trip to Vienta is daunting. It yeah, takes forever to get there and get back. It was it's uh, it's mm -hmm. you know you have to you have to be in and then to walk through the airports you're walking miles through airports over there. It's it's mm -hmm. uh it's, it's it's rough. It was rough. It's a good thing I'm in good as shape as I am to have made it. And actually, yeah. then then I was here the, the second time getting the lutetium treatment, and I caught and I got COVID. And, oh. I, had fly back, yes. and I had to fly back with COVID. And my gosh, by you know, the time I got to Heathrow Airport, um, I said, "But when I get to Miami, I'm going to need a, I'm going to need a wheelchair to get to get to the car rental place." Oh gosh, it's, it's a it's, it's a brutal slap over there. Hey Jim, how old are you, Jim? How old am I? 64 uh, and a half. You're a powerful guy. I'm impressed with your resilience. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I am also on, I am also on an extensive uh, vitamin regimen as well. So. Did you have to stay for a few days after your treatment because of the radioactivity? You know, it's int interesting over there with their, I mean, their, their attitude in the United States, uh, when you get lutetium, my gosh, their, their precautions are, you know, uh, significant here in the United States. And they, they re read you a whole list of precautions and, you know, eat off paper plates for the first few days, throw it in the trash and don't, don't let your wife take out the trash. I mean, they're seriously concerned about it here in the U.S. In the, in over, over there, they're, it's 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 no big deal um you know they they just said oh you don't have to worry about it i said well we got a hotel room in my wife so we and we got two double beds so you know i don't, i'm not close to her you know and he's like oh you didn't have to do that so they're really less laxed over there on the radiation concerns the radioactivity concerns <clears throat> interesting so that was an interesting aspect of getting treated over there as opposed to over here i mean so what happened when I when I got what happened the cheap? second time, Jim? Uh, I, I, I guess the wife said, I'm coming with. She didn't want your daughter to go with you this time, huh? <laughs> she, she right. She said, I'm yes. coming along. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And was it, wasn't, wasn't what it was uh, cracked up to be. It wasn't what the brochure said, okay. for sure. But if anybody ever has any additional questions, be happy to chat with you guys. Jim, did they help you with accommodations or you had to sort that out yourself? Yeah, I mean, the the, accom the accommodations were, you know, it was a Hilton Hotel a block away. I was literally, literally within easy walking distance to the doctor's office. But you set that up yourself or they did it for you? Oh, um, they 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 told they told us about it, and then I, I I just used a travel agent for everything to get set up to go over there and uh, the hotel and all that. And there was no language barrier; they all spoke English well. In English English is very 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 common. Most everybody speaks English, but uh, you know there you never know what language is going to come out of somebody's mouth over there. Um, that's uh, you know, very, very diverse. Yeah. Well, is it all right if we move on, Jim? I mean, it's wonderful to have course, you back. Of course, of course. I was just thinking this is just, uh, I'm burning up the whole the whole uh, time here. So I'm glad to update you guys. I hope that, I hope that information is useful to some of you guys. Or no, actually, I hope you don't get to that point where you need this information. That's, that's my real well wish because you know i'm i'm i'm, I'm running over there because i'm you know terrified that this thing's the run the runaway freight train that peter refers to you know so i'm i'm trying trying to stop it in its tracks okay. done a really good job getting educated jim thanks yeah. for sharing it means a lot to us yeah, all sure. thank you david
Okay, thank you so much, Jim. Uh, Alan Babcock, you, I believe, had something for us? Yeah, just a real quick update. So I had another uh, PSA, it was undetectable. So Gainesman said, you know, we don't need to be going three months at a time. <clears throat> He's gonna jack it up to four months, which I, I was fine with that. It's pretty conservative. He didn't say six. So, um, you know, I'm just sitting there kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop. Uh, <laughs> but in the meantime, um, you no, know, life is good. All right. Well, don't worry about the other shoe dropping. Just start enjoying life and. Yeah, I do my I best. Listen, I listened to him. I listened to Dr. Gainesman yesterday talking about, um, I think it was PARP inhibitors. Whatever it was, it wasn't yeah. new information. And um, But it was good to see him and to hear him present. I mean, I did it not for the information so much as just to see how he comes across. So uh, it was good to see too, him. Rick. I was pretty impressed with him. He he seemed very uh, down to earth, easy to talk to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he, just, he just puts out confidence. I mean, you're sitting there talking to him and he's like, yeah, you know, that's where we are now. And if, if something pops up, well, then I'm going to deal with it. Nothing's going to get you because I have a bunch of tools in my toolbox. And so you needn't worry. I'll do the worrying and I'll take care of anything that comes up. And you just feel like, yeah, he's, this guy's going to do it. So, very nice. All right. Keep up the good work, Alan. And we will go to Joel Blanchett next. Yes, thank you, Len. Um, on, uh, as you know, from what I reported before, I had uh, SBRT to my L4, L5, and T6 and T9 in November and December. Um, then um, Dr. E wanted me to take uh, another round like I did last August in February, uh, she wanted me to take uh, a, a PSMA PET, which was my sixth one. Uh, and then uh, she also wanted me to take a uh, whole body MRI. I flew to Houston on the 11th, on the 12th. I had both of those tests back to back. Uh, the um, PSMA was a breeze. Uh, of course, as most of you know, you sit in a room for 45 minutes after the injection. Uh, you can either go to sleep or sleep uh, or in an easy chair or your bed. And um, and then they, they put you through the machine. Well, Houston Methodist put in a brand new machine last August. And um, and they do a PSMA scan now, Gallium 68, the Lucix, in seven minutes. So that was great. Uh, only seven minutes for a PSMA scan. Uh, I don't know what the capabilities are around the country with this new machine, but anyway, uh, that, was, that part was very good. What was not good is that they put in a catheter for me. They couldn't find my, my veins, so they put a catheter in my um, left hand vein, and which was fine initially. Uh, it, went, it was sealed right through the PSMA scan. Uh, but then when I got to the, um, they, they knew I was going to go for the uh, uh, MRI next, uh, uh, one floor lower in the building where Dr. E is. And, uh, uh, and uh, for, unfortunately, the guy doing it was a novice and he was supervised by a nurse part of the time. He didn't tighten the catheter on the needle. And so that caused me problems later, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, so I went to the scanner MRI and um, two and a half hours, not seven minutes, but two and a half hours on this one. And uh, the last half hour, half hour was really torture. Um, uh, not only was I hot, but uh, they uh, came to a point where I don't remember them ever doing this to me. They put some glucose called glucon, or I don't have the right name, but it was a glucose substance in my... Uh, in my um, uh, IV so that um, uh, they said they did that so that it would, it would freeze my uh, colon in place and stop movement, uh, which would then take better MRI pictures. Don't remember ever having that before. 10 minutes later, they come back and put in um, the um, uh, gadolinium. 
Uh, and uh, so they did that. And when they put it in, I could feel the, the cold uh, gadolinium going in, which I've had a lot of experience with. And uh, then all of a sudden, uh, that, that nut broke loose and uh, dripped, uh, it dripped uh, down the rest of my hand. So uh, after the whole thing was over with, I told the nurse about it. And, uh, and what happens if that nut gets loose on the needle, the needle then starts flowing my blood backwards. So when uh, after half an hour of being in the machine, the last half hour, my blood was actually flowing out of me. Along, uh, so the nurse went to check her, her, her pictures. She says, well, I have evidence that she did get some contrast because I can see it on the pictures. So I says, okay. So she was not concerned about the quality of the pictures. So, um, but, you know, she wiped the blood off and took the needle out. And when she tried to pull the needle out, the needle stayed in place because the nut was loose on, on the hose or the, or the catheter and it just broke loose and, and the needle was still in my hand. But anyway, that was not a big issue. It was just that it just goes to show that it was not put in properly by the novice OJT nurse. So, um, so uh, two days later, I had a telemedicine um, appointment with Dr. E. Uh, she called me, was uh, last Thursday, I believe, and, um, and uh, on the 15th. And uh, uh, um, there was no evidence of any cancer, prostate cancer, uh, on either scan. Uh, Yay! But of course, we all know that there's some metastatic prostate cancer in me. Uh, but, um, uh, but there was one concerning thing. I had taken a blood test for Dr. E, ordered by Dr. E on 31 January. <clears throat> and the blood test, I had never seen so much red on a blood test. I had about, I don't know, I'm just guessing here, but 15, 20 lines were red. Most of them were red, um, um, one point above the range or one point below the range. So that was most of them. But the most concerning was my white blood count, red blood count, platelets, and my lymphocytes, and my uh, something else, uh, the uh, lymphocyte and the neutrophils. Um, so, um, so Dr. E was also concerned about that. I was so concerned about it because I'd never seen so much red in a blood, uh, blood test. I went to see my PCP before I even talked to Dr. E that day. I went to see my PCP, and uh, she says, oh, that's the darolunamide doing it. You need to get off of that darolunamide. I says, okay. So then I also queried my local GU medical oncologist at, uh, in over Fairfax, and he said uh, he wasn't concerned about it at all. He says, well, you're, you're within close to range within most things. He says, you need another blood test in 30 days. So I talked to Dr. E about it, and Dr. E says, yeah, I'm concerned about it, but I'm really only concerned with your white blood cells. I said, well, what caused that to happen? She says, I believe it's your uh, radiation. Uh, and I had researched on the internet before I even talked to Dr. E that it said that radiation therapy or chemotherapy can cause your white blood count to, to, to drop. And you guys, you guys, last week, I wasn't here, but I did listen to the recording, had an excellent discussion on white blood cells and platelets and red blood cells last week. So that helped me out a lot. Uh, so um, so anyway, she has ordered uh, for one March another bl uh, blood test, CBC uh, blood test for me. And so we'll find out how, uh, how I'm doing then. But she wasn't concerned about all the other ones, uh, except for the w w white blood count. So. Um, um. Joel, I thought you were off the darolutamide. Did you go back on the darolutamide? No, I, I was never on Lupron. I was only on Orgovix and on darolutamide. I asked Dr. E, are you still planning to uh, leave me on for 24 months? She said, yes. Uh, she says, is that okay with you? I said, yes, if that's what you think is best, I, it's okay with me. And uh, so I, she says, well, how do you feel? I said, well, my only real problem is that I can't sleep very long at night. I sleep four or five hours and I wake up and then I have to get up for a couple hours and go back to sleep. She says, oh, those are the hormones acting up. So once we get you off of the hormones, that should go away. So I had never heard of that before. So I was glad to hear that. So that I was not an aberration. I've never had a problem my whole life going to sleep, but uh, with, with, the, with these hormones I have been. 
Um, so um, I am taking also an FDG PET scan on 29 uh, February from the FDA because she wants me to do that to to do a concordant test with the with the uh, with the uh, PSMA PET. So um, so that's happening also at the same time. But anyway, right now I'm just waiting for my next blood test to uh, uh, so I know. Uh, if my white blood cells are going to go up along with the, all the other categories that are in the red. You know, one thing that I was wondering was whether um, these adverse blood tests might have been related to other treatments you were doing. Um, because, you know, back in January, you had a lot of issues from the Manjaro and your blood pressure and all of that. Yeah, uh, I thought of that too. Uh, I did ask Dr. E about that. She said, no, Dr. Manjaro wouldn't do that. So I, I specifically asked that question because I thought of the, the Manjaro too since I was allergic to it uh, and after taking it for three months. Uh, but uh, no, she said that uh, definitely had nothing to do with it. So she was confident that it wasn't the Manjaro. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna see my, she told me to go see my PCP and uh, see if I can get a, uh, on a Zembic as opposed to Manjaro uh, to see what my PCP says. So my PCP liked that I was on Manjaro, but she says it was a very good drug, uh, but I don't know which, how she's gonna feel about my, my being allergic to it and going to another drug of uh, similar uh, effect. So, um, so um, uh, the question I have for you is, have you ever heard of anybody going through SBRT with a problem with white blood cells before? Okay, yeah, it's not it. uncommon, Joe. Uh, radiation does damage to your bone marrow if, if they're right. radiating the bones, and that's going to impact your blood counts. Do you recall what your white blood cell count was, how low it was? Uh, I have it right in front of me here. Let me see if I can turn to the right page. The white blood cells are uh, 2.4. Yep, that's good pretty low what, what's your absolute neutrophils absolute neutrophils are um 1344 four, 1344 yeah, some people don't worry until it gets to a thousand i get worried mine's 1.64 so uh, i uh, i worry about that i they had a big debate about my uh, whether it was the SBRT or the darylutamide the general consensus from my medical oncologist and radiation oncologist is the darylutamide, and I get to don't worry about it. And my white count vacillates. We talked about that last week. Right. Okay, so you, you're of the opinion that darylutamide may be doing the, 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 uh, well, the that's white what they count. That's what they tell me. And, you know, I had five uh, days of radiation pretty intensively to my to my rib and my uh, my 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 lung and my uh, and my uh, spine. So you basically have the same situation as I do. Uh, you've been radiated with SVRT and you also in darylutamide. That's correct. And Orgavix, right? Right. And with me, it's my and I I I I, I, I de-escalated from 600 BID to 300 BID, hoping it would uh, you know reduce the uh, the, the white count uh, reduction. Has it? No. It went up for a while, went up to 4,200, then dropped down to 2,400. So I, uh, you know, I'm struggling with that too. Okay. But my medical oncologist seems very, very, uh, you know, I don't know if it's cavalier, but very calm about it because he sees it all the time. And he tells me not to worry. So two months from now when I see him, we'll see whether or not it's changed. Okay, very good. Well, that's good, good info. Uh, anybody have questions for Joe? I, I've, okay. uh, I just I just, uh, I just wanted to say that um, my 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 doctor has uh, always been concerned, and so the radiologist is all always concerned about bone marrow. 
because I, I actually was trying to get them to uh, provide do SBRT on my L4 where I also have cancer lesions uh, a year or two ago. And they said, well, we really don't want to do that because of the bone marrow. And, and that would have, and that comes in, that really comes into play later for these treatments like actinium and lutetium, you know, um, because you need to have those levels pretty high or healthy. But I, 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 I've actually been surprised it hasn't, that bone marrow issue and radiation hasn't come up more in the group. Okay. Okay. If no other questions for Joe, we'll, we'll move on to Terrell. Think he may not. He may have no left. He, he, well, yeah, he usually leaves after about ninety minutes. Oh, so he didn't say he was leaving early. So no, he he never does, but he he usually does. Um, All right, so I just put something in the chat from Johns Hopkins about blood cells being produced in the bone marrow and which bones contain most of the marrow that produces those cells. So, Joel, I know you've had a lot of SBRT to your spine. I don't know if you've had it to any other areas, but uh, I guess a combination of the radiation you've had plus the ADT and, and Darrow, I wouldn't pin it all on Darrow because ADT alone can cause uh, bone marrow suppression yeah. and you're taking uh, Orgovix. Yeah. yeah, no, I've had two other rounds of radiation, SBRT. Uh, oh, the first one was at the uh, uh, NIH uh, clinical trial, PSMA, uh, found some cancer in my left iliac bone and that was radiated by the same radiation oncologist successfully. And then I also found uh, through later PSMAs that I had uh, a uh, right occipital condyle bone in the back of my head uh, with uh, prostate cancer, and they radiated that too. So uh, this is my yeah. third big round of radiation I've gone through. Did you respond yeah. adversely with your blood counts to previous? No, this was the first time. No, first time, okay. Let, um, I just I want to switch. Um, Keith Hilton, you came in a little late after we'd done the roll call. Um, is this the first time you're muted right now, by the way, so you'll need to unmute. Um, yes, this is the first you. meeting I've been to. I right. am new here. So let, let, what we usually do with new men is we start off with them, but you do need to be here in the first 10 minutes because, as you can see, we have a pretty big group. Uh, we I understand usually, that. I had um, some technical problems, so. Yeah, no out. problem. Um, that's why we, we didn't get to you because because you came in a little late. We do have 17 minutes left or a little more we can go over. Um, I, okay, I, I can give a you a background. Time. Would you well, like me to give you a... Um, Len, do you want to ask Keith some questions? Yeah, <clears throat> sure. Um, Looks like I don't have my handy dandy uh, newbie question guy, but I guess I can wing it. Uh, so, Keith, uh, tell us how old you are and where you live. Okay, I am 76 years old and I am a 19 year survivor of prostate cancer. I was in uh, Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War, was exposed to Agent Orange. I was diagnosed in 2004, December 2004, and my PSA doubling time right from the beginning was uh, less than two and a half months. It has remained that. I had a robotic surgery by Dr. Menon at Henry Ford, Detroit, in April of 2005. Uh, December of 2006, I had radiation due to increasing PSA. I had 38 treatments. 
My PSA only went down to 0 0.3. In 2011, my PSA had gone to 1.8. In September of 2012, it went to 17.9. I switched doctors and switched hospitals. I went on to Lupron in an experimental and a clinical trial, IMCA12. My PSA dropped to undetectable in six weeks. It stayed quite low under one until June of 2016. And then I had a bone scan, DEXA scan, CT scan with possible metastasis to the vertebrae. I went on Lupron. In August of 2016, oh, you, you told us you were already on Lupron. I had uh, been on in 2012. 2012. And so 2016, were you on Lupron the whole time? I was not continuously. I was on and off, I believe, on that. Um, and uh, you said something about a clinical trial. What, what uh, drug? I was at a clinical trial at uh, Carmine's Cancer Center. They were testing an experimental drug to see whether or not it was more effective than Lupron. It was not yeah. found to be more effective, but they stopped the clinical trial. It may have been as effective, but it, uh, they did not continue it. So, Okay. Um, I had a sodium fluoride PET scan in August of 2016, and it showed a pinpoint bright glow in one area of my pelvic bone. The next treatment I had was uh, cryogenic. They went in and froze it. Then I had almost undetectable uh, PSA for about four years. I had another... Uh, cryogenic procedure in uh, January of this year, and it went wider and deeper, but it was not effective. Currently, my PSA is about 7.65, and I'm still at a PSA doubling time of uh, two and a half months. I just started on the 14th of February. I started on Xtandi, and I've been taking Orgovix for about a year. And I was hesitant to take the Xtandi, and I talked to a friend of mine that I had referred to Kamanos. He's been on the medication for a year, and it's doing great for him. So I was interesting, interested, interested in the uh, conversations earlier about Xtandi. Uh, I don't know what else might be suitable for me. I have not and I don't know how to pronounce that, darlumide, darlutamide. I don't know how to spell that or pronounce it yeah. properly. That's how long? Like you, you just started uh, Xtandi five days ago, is that right? That's correct. Okay, so it's a little early for you to tell how you're tolerating right. it. Right. At 30 days from the starting of taking it, I'll be meeting with my doctor again, who is the head of research at Kaimanos. Who is it you're seeing, Dr. Heath? Yes. Well, she's real good, so, um, but you might ask her if she can put you on darolutamide rather than Xtandi. Sometimes okay. you have to ask them, but she's she cares, she's real good, and, um, you know, you have one of the better doctors in the country there, so um, that's that's good, but you might ask her, if she could get you on to darolutamide rather than Xtandi. You, uh, our experience with the men in this group has been they do, they have lesser side effects. Can you spell that? Is that D A R O L U T A M I D E? And the, the trade name is Nubeka, N U B E Q A. We'll put it in the chat window for you. How about the fact that he responds so well to Abby on several occasions, though? Yeah. They've been following me very closely. Uh, often I was uh, in the hospital every three, three, week, three months, and 
following my PSA and so forth. And um, uh, good how long have you been? And, uh, a lot of prayer. How long have you been with? Uh, I've been with, with Carmano Heath. since 2011. And and how long? I mean, Doctor Heath hasn't been there that long. I know. How long has she been your doc? She has been there uh, from 2011. She was involved in the uh, clinical trial. Oh, I thought she, I thought she was somewhere else, and then she came to come on us a few years ago. When Doctor um, um, Doctor V left and went to Michigan, Doctor. She might have been involved in a clinical trial, but I don't think she was with Carmenos back then. Um, she came in when Dr. Um, Varampian, uh, whatever her name was, left and went to University of Michigan. He came back, too. I have seen him also. No, it's a lady I'm thinking of. Well, okay. Well, it's a very similar name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, has have you done any genetic and genomic testing i have uh twice uh i did it uh i don't know some years ago and just recently the 23rd of january they did more genetic testing i don't have results back from that yet was that somatic testing this time did they what did they take um was it with blood first of all or was it from it was with fish? blood yeah with i mean blood. most likely it was i was told it was going to be much more extensive than the original yeah my guess is it's somatic um jim marshall you want to say a few words about um our veterans group uh yes keith on let's see on thursday uh we will be online okay at the same time and we eight o'clock and if you would care to join us because i heard that you were a vietnam vet as i am i was actually stationed in the philippines and i was stationed in thailand twice I was uh, in thailand, Air Force. you are eligible Yes, I am. Uh, I am fully considered 100% disabled. I've had that since 2012. Okay, and uh, you should come in. Are you collecting the? Um, let Let's the not, extra Jim, money? Jim, Jim, Jim. Okay. Time out. Okay. Let's okay. not. Let Let's not get into the details right. in this one, but come to the other one. The other thing is, um, and and we'll get into it, but. We strongly recommend you be um, dual registered because you, as as General Joel will tell you, uh, you can get some um, great benefits on your um, on your drug costs. So come on in on um, Thursday, same time, same bat channel and uh, we'll go through you or the gents will go through through with you in some detail to make sure you're getting everything you're entitled to okay i probably got that pretty well i i've got better health insurance than anybody i know so okay between, okay uh, and do we have your email address keith or are you registered with us did you get a you reminder not, from this group? you do not have my email address yet but uh less does have it i've corresponded with less Okay, if you'd like to put it, you can you can just put it directly to me or to Len. If you'd like to put it in the chat window, um, if you would like to about... receive a, a reminder before every meeting and a reminder for the vets group and for any other group that, that, that you're interested in, we send out a reminder before every meeting. The reminder is kind of a newsletter as well. Okay, I would like that, but I don't know anything about the chat window or how to do that sort of thing. So I can. There's two. Let you if you join the meeting, it's always good to use the chat. There's a lot that goes on in there and lots of good information. There are two little squares in the top right of your screen, 
and if you click on that it'll open a window and you can enter a message at the bottom and you can choose who that message goes to okay and if you click on i think it's the where it'll probably say everyone if you click on that you can send your email to everyone if you'd like other people to contact you or you can send it just to me or to len we're listed at the top and we'll make sure that you get the reminders okay thank you keith do you recall your original gleason score it was seven uh four plus three yeah this is not uncommon when i hear guys tell me about being 19 year survivors and we're having several recurrences and going on treatment and going down to uh, undetectable multiple times it's typically a, a seven as opposed to a eight nine or ten so i mean that works in your favor is what i'm saying keith good <laughs> uh, you'll like you're likely you know continue responding to treatment even uh, even dr heath doesn't really know why i'm still alive the median lifetime survival time was two and a half years for people no. to, that were diagnosed in 2004. Not, not a Gleason 7. Well, at the time, that was the median survival time. Not even then. No, but... I, mean, I think that was for people who were metastatic at that time and probably were higher Gleason. I mean, Those who problem... have been exposed to Agent Orange are likely, are more likely out of four out of fiber I, I believe it is that uh, are outside of the uh, prostate at the time that they're discovered well any questions for Keith guys or Keith you have any questions for us just I've listened before about the uh, men's experience with Xtandi and the darolutamide and uh, that sounds like a better option to me. Um, I was quite uh, reluctant to take the Xtandi, but um, I'm a uh, cancer advocate for Carmanos, but my experience and my education has been prior to being cancer resistant. That has just occurred in the last uh, two months or so. bit of a shock to me actually I, I knew it was coming eventually but I would like to have it uh, completely out of my body but that's uh, well you know Keith uh, for most guys Xtandi produces more fatigue and brain fog <clears throat> than darolutamide and all the other similar drugs uh, but it's not true for everybody so they're all equally efficacious. If you find that you're tolerating it well, there may not be any need to switch to, you know, to darolutamide. But um, what? In, in general, darolutamide, because it doesn't penetrate the blood-brain barrier, it does tend to uh, produce less fatigue and brain fog. Those on the group that have been on the Xtandi, what... Uh... How many milligrams were they taking per day? I'm taking 40 milligrams. Uh, just, and actually, if my, I started out with taking, there are a correction, that's 40 milligram capsules. They wanted me to take two per day. The first five days, I've taken one just to get started on it because of the side effects. I wanted to be sure it was an easy start. I think the normal dose is four capsules per day. Is that right, guys? Anybody? I have. I've never been on Xtandi, but I think that's the dose. Anybody been on Xtandi? Yeah, I was on four, four, four is the normal dose, and I was on that, and I had trouble tolerating it, and I switched to three, 
and it's uh, I tolerate it much better, and it does its job. Uh, this is a 40 milligram. I understand there's also an 80 milligram capsule. The, for, the 40 milligrams is the more normal one. The 30? 40. Four, 40. Normal dose is four tablets of 40 milligrams each, so 160 milligrams. Okay, my testosterone was down to less than 10 and on, on the Orgovix, and my doubling time was still two and a half months, and my PSA was going up for the last four, four measures of it. So she was trying to push my um, testosterone level down to zero. Um, yeah. In the discussion of PSA, uh, not if you have PSA level of whatever it is, that is not necessarily um, cancerous PSA. There is normal PSA, and not all of it was created by the prostate gland. But, you had your uh, prostate removed, didn't you? Yes, yes. But so any, there's still any PSA that you're producing would be from a cancer cell. There is still another gland uh, that does produce PSA. I, I don't adrenal. recall Which the one? name. The I, adrenal I don't, gland. The adrenal no, gland. The, the adrenal gland doesn't produce PSA. The adrenal well, gland one of them is, produces the adrenal testosterone. Gland, the, the adrenal gland is responsible for testosterone, but if you're aware of another gland that produces PSA, we'd, we'd love to hear about it. Well, that's what I was told. And, uh, Who told you? From, I, I believe it was from Carmanos. I don't it's think, not, I, 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 well, I, I, we won't say no, but please come back and tell I'll us about it. it. We've, yeah, I'll we've been in this game almost as long as you have, and we're not aware of any other glands that, that produce PSA. now. We are aware of other glands that produce PSMA. It might have been they told you that there are other glands that produce PSMA, which is prostate-specific membrane antigen. Yes, there are, but they don't produce PSA. Okay. Yeah, but Rick, if, if he, his recollection is that they told him the adrenal glands, I think he's mixed up PSA and testosterone. Could be, yeah. No, no. We, 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 no. We, we know no, that there the is. adrenals produce testosterone. I was told not 100% of the PSA or the PSMA that was detected in, in your uh, PSA tests comes from the uh, prostate itself. There is another gland. I'll ask about it. All right, Keith. I think we can wrap it up, guys. What do you think? I do. Call it a night. All right. Thanks so much for your participation tonight, everybody. And Thanks, we'll Len. see you next Thanks, week. Ciao, ciao. Thanks, you did a great job. Thank you, Len. Good job, Len. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody.